I'm, I'm honored to be here, and uh, I'm embarrassed to admit that I've not been to Idaho before. And I figured that before speaking with you today, I ought to get a feel for this incredible state and this remarkable city. So last night, uh, the Albertson Family Foundation team hosted me for dinner, and I peppered them with questions, and, and I learned about uh, the, the kind of the three capitals of Idaho, not just Boise, but Spokane and Salt Lake City, and I learned... Uh, I, I learned about why it is that um, Idaho is such a source of seeds, not just the, the fruit itself, but the seeds, because uh, where there's an arid climate uh, and, and uh, uh, fruit trees are irrigated rather than uh, using pr uh, uh, precipitation, uh, seeds are what you produce. So I've, I've been learning a lot about Idaho, but since I'm going to talk a little bit about this new world of crowdfunding, I figured I ought to uh, take a crowdfunding tour of Boise. Now, uh, I started this tour at Kickstarter. How many of you uh, are familiar with Kickstarter? How many of you have backed a project on Kickstarter? Raise your hands. All right, awesome. It looks like about two-thirds of you. What we're looking at are three projects on Kickstarter that uh, folks in Boise have created. Now, for those of you who uh, didn't raise your hands, Kickstarter is a funding platform for creative projects. Last year alone, people raised $500 million for creative and wacky ideas uh, through the site alone. And, and uh, these three Boise projects start on the left with um, a couple longtime Boise residents, uh, Maggie and Jake, who dreamed of creating a nano brewery uh, not far from where we're sitting right now. A nano brewery is even smaller than a, a micro brewery uh, because it involves a four barrel rather than a 10 barrel uh, uh, fermentation system. And to complete their dream and create a nano brewery here in Boise and a nano pub, they needed about $30,000 to buy the fermenter uh, that would complete this dream. And about 100 people, not just in Boise, but from all over America, gave them the funds to do that through Kickstarter. In the middle, you see an amazing uh, Boise dancer, Lauren Edson, uh, who has danced in all sorts of Boise troops and uh, who, with her fellow dancers, has been invited to perform in California, in New York, and in Florida. So she went on Kickstarter to get the funds she needs uh, to take that trip with uh, uh, her fellow Boise dancers. And on the right, uh, you see um, a, uh, a woman, Josie Erskine, who has created the Peaceful Belly uh, Farm and Education Center here in Boise. It's a 70-acre uh, farm, urban farm, because it's in Boise proper. And uh, they needed the funds to complete this barn in which they're going to teach people uh, how to cook uh, and really demonstrate farm-to-fork uh, uh, food production and enable Boise residents to have their own uh, gardening plots. Uh, a storm had recently uh, uh, ruined the, the roof as it was near completion. And on Kickstarter, they got the $15,000 they needed to complete that roof. Now, five years ago and before, these creative folks, Maggie and Jake, Lauren Edson, Josie Erskine, they would have needed a rich uncle or years of working their way up the ladder or industry connections before they could have done these projects. Kickstarter does away with all that. Let's you ask your friends and the world at large to support your creativity without any gatekeepers or tastemakers standing in your way. If your idea is awesome, it'll probably get funded. So after uh, checking out, uh, after kind of taking the pulse of Boise on Kickstarter, uh, I went to Etsy. Uh, raise your hand if you have bought an item on Etsy uh, over the last year, even more than have backed a project on Kickstarter. For the few of you who didn't raise your hands, Etsy is a marketplace of things that are made by hand. And I bet, you, I bet few of you know that crafters in Boise alone have 34,000 different items for sale on Etsy. And we are looking, we're looking at three of the weirdest, um, <laughs> which, uh, which include a, a crocheted uh, baby mermaid uh, outfit uh, and a, a, a zebra wood carved bow tie. Uh, and uh, mustache straws. Uh, I, I know that you've been yearning for all three of those items, and rest assured, you can get them on Etsy from Boise Crafters. Now, uh, the, the, so many of the items, so many of the crafts uh, that are for sale on Etsy, and, and by the way, uh, last year alone, uh, people bought $2 billion of handmade crafts through Etsy alone. And these crafts are overwhelmingly made by people who used to work office jobs all day, reluctantly. They really wanted to be crafting. 
but they could only do that as a kind of a side hobby in their spare time. Few of these folks could have scored the investment you need to uh, make a prototype uh, that you can manufacture or persuade Macy's or Walmart to sell their product or raise millions of advertising dollars to get consumers to buy their product. That's a process which lets only a lucky few become designers. And of course, it's a process that can suck the personality out of your creation. But then Etsy came along. And now crafters and woodworkers and artisans can pursue their passion as their day job and sell their, their work to people all over the world. They don't have to break through all the barriers that until recently stood in the way of anyone who wanted to make beautiful things for a living. So after checking out uh, Boise's offerings on Kickstarter and Etsy, of course, I had to go to donorschoose.org and check out uh, some of the 2,100 classroom projects that Idaho teachers have gotten funded through DonorsChoose.org. And specifically, I checked out the 357 classroom projects that Boise teachers have gotten funded through our site. On the left, uh, you see seventh graders in Mrs. Skirkle's class at Liberty Elementary School, I think not too far from here. Uh, she wanted her students to be able to do uh, spelling and mathematics applications, learn at their own pace, use some of the adaptive learning technologies that are now available. And for that, she needed uh, a set of Chromebooks and some iPads. And about 10 donors made her $2,000 classroom dream come true. Uh, in the middle, you see, um, I want to tell you that that man is their teacher, but in fact, um, it, uh, this is Mrs. Spittle's class at Lake Hazel Elementary School, and she wanted her students to meet a, 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 a true life mountain man so that her students could interact with someone uh, from the pages of history, but, but, but in the flesh, and learn about the Old West uh, from a, from a first hand reenactment. And uh, her, her project, Mrs. Spittle's project at Lake Hazel Ele Elementary School was uh, compelling enough that uh, her project to bring in this mountain man uh, to talk with her students and interact with her students was funded by, I think, three Boise residents, but was also funded by someone in Brooklyn and someone in Washington, D.C., and by Cards Against Humanity. They supported her project. Um, and... <laughs> And finally, uh, on the right, you see um, a student at Capitol High School in Mrs. Nichols' class. And Mrs. Nichol wanted to uh, create a maker space in the library of Capitol High School. Not w one that would not just have a 3D printer, but which would have uh, a sewing machine and um, all sorts of uh, woodworking equipment so that students could uh, sew a tote bag and uh, construct a cardboard chair and, and make and, and learn through sensory experiences and, and kind of get an introduction to, to engineering and, and ultimately to robotics. Her $1,000 classroom dream came true thanks to two donors. At DonorsChoose.org, teachers go straight to the public with their best ideas for helping students learn. They don't need to fill something out in triplicate or uh, first uh, uh, pay their dues. Uh, in fact, there, there's, there's nothing standing between a teacher's idea and a potential supporter. There's a change underway, which I want to talk about with you this afternoon. It's a change in who you have to know and how lucky you have to be and how long you have to wait to bring a good idea to life. It's about a, a new kind of marketplace where gatekeepers do not stand in your way. A lot of people refer to this movement as crowdfunding or micro-giving or peer-to-peer or -peer, uh, uh, commerce. And, and DonorsChoose.org is, is a pioneer of this movement. So I want to I wanna give you the inside story. And then we're going to do something that has never been done before at Ed Sessions. It's going to be a surprise toward the end. So, so stay, stay with me. Um, I want to ask you for one last show of hands as I begin this, this uh, inside story. And that is, how many of you had a teacher in high school who changed your life? Raise your hand if that applies to you. So just about everyone here had a teacher like that. I also had a teacher like that. Uh, my, my high school classmate who's here, Decker Rolf, will remember this teacher. His name is Mr. Buxton. Um, he was uh, my English teacher and wrestling coach in high school. And when I showed up as a dorky freshman, uh, Mr. Buxton spoke to me like he would to any adult. If he approved or disapproved of something I'd done, I knew it right away because he didn't have that mask that some grown-ups have when they're talking to kids. 
If I asked him a question on Wednesday, he'd come back to me on Friday saying that he'd thought about it, and he really had. He made you feel like he wanted you on his team. And looking back on it, I think it was Mr. Buxton who made me want to be a teacher. So 15 years ago, I started teaching history at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. But Wings Academy did not have the same resources as when I was in Mr. Buxton's classroom. Where I went to high school, we went on field trips into the woods. We had graphing calculators for trigonometry, the supplies to do just about any art project. But when I started teaching in the Bronx, I saw firsthand that all schools are not created equal. My colleagues and I would spend a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, and we would talk in the teacher's lunchroom about books that we wanted our students to read, and a field trip we wanted to take them on, and a microscope that we needed for a science experiment. What I wanted for my students was a uh, little house on the prairie. Those of you uh, who only saw the TV show might think I was dumbing things down, but those of you who read the book will remember that Little House on the Prairie is actually a gripping, unsentimental account of pioneer life. And I will talk all afternoon about how awesome the book is. But um, my, my students, even those who had never left New York City, they, they loved this book too. But the New York City school system was not about to underwrite uh, a, a set of Little House on the Prairie for each of my students. So uh, every day before school, I would get up uh, at dawn and I would go to the copy shop open 24 hours a day and I would photocopy that day's section of Little House on the Prairie, which probably violated all sorts of copyright laws. Um, and, and as I was making photocopies, I started thinking about all those resources that my colleagues wanted for their students. And it occurred to me that there must be people out there who would want to help teachers like us if they could see exactly where their money was going. So using pencil and paper, I drew out a website where public school teachers could create classroom project requests and donors could choose the projects they wanted to support. For $2,000, this programmer who'd recently arrived from Poland was willing to turn my drawings into software and he built version one uh, of our site. It was super rudimentary, so much so that uh, the back end of our site was one page that you'd have to scroll down and scroll down for like 15 minutes to get to the teacher or the projects that you were looking for. To process a donation, I had one of those black boxes that you see at the grocery store where you punch in the credit card number and the dollar amount, send it over a telephone line. So it was like PayPal, but by hand. Uh, and it was a really good thing my students were helping me to get the site off the ground. And then I had to get my colleagues to try out this site and, and post the first projects. Now, I don't know how it is at the schools where you work or the companies where you work, but at the high school where I was teaching, if you wanted to get folks to do something, if you wanted to get adults to do something, you gave them free food. And what, uh, what you see right there is uh, my mom's roasted pear dessert. She would do these pears with orange rind and apricot jam and spices, and, and let me tell you, they tasted something incredible. So my mom made 11 of these pears, and I brought them into the teacher's lunchroom. And as my colleagues prepared to pounce, I said, hold up, there's a toll. If you eat one of these pears, you got to go to this new website and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Sounded like a pretty good deal. And it took my colleagues like two minutes to scarf the 11 pears, and then they proceeded to post the first 11 projects. The health teacher, uh, she wanted to do a pregnancy prevention project for which she needed uh, baby think it over dolls, which are uh, life size, life weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed. I see some uh, uh, nods of affirmation that maybe you have uh, used this as well. And boy, does it impress upon a teenager what their responsibilities would be uh, if they had a kid and how they probably want to avoid those responsibilities until a little later. Uh, the uh, English teacher, he wanted to get his students ready for the SAT, so he requested test prep books. The art teacher, she ate uh, the third pair, and she wanted to do a wall-to-wall -wall quilt with each of her students sewing a square, and for that she needed fabric and thread and needles. My aunt, uh, who's a nurse, she funded the first project, but I didn't know any more donors to fund the other ten projects, uh, so I funded them myself, which I could afford to do because I was still living at home with my parents, and, and they weren't charging me any rent, so I could spare some of my teacher's salary to, to uh, fund these 10 projects. And because I donated anonymously, my colleagues mistakenly thought that the website actually worked. <laughs> and, that, and that there were all of these donors just, just waiting to fulfill teachers' classroom dreams, like hanging out on the site. 
That rumor spread across the Bronx, and teachers started posting hundreds of projects, projects that needed a whole lot more money than what I could afford living at home with my parents. And I was in a really, really tough spot, not knowing how I was going to get these projects funded. But my students came to the rescue. They, they could see the potential of this experiment to change their lives at school. And I think they also felt bad for me. Uh, <laughs> so for several months, they volunteered every day after school to spread word to potential donors. They addressed and compiled 2,000 letters by hand to people all over the country, telling them about this website where someone with $10 could be a classroom hero. We sorted the mail uh, ourselves to get the cheapest postal rate, and uh, uh, every desk in my classroom represented a different region of the country, piled high with envelopes. And then we, uh, we, we carted the sorted letters to the post office and, and crossed our fingers. It worked. My students' letter writing campaign generated $30,000 in donations to projects on our site. We were off. Another year went by. Teachers created some more projects, uh, most of them in the Bronx, and donors funded some of them. And then 9-11 happened. And teachers at the schools beside Ground Zero started creating projects on our site to recover from the attacks on the World Trade Center. There's a, a high school math teacher whose students' calculators were sealed at the disaster site. Their classroom had been relocated to a basement, so she requested a new set of calculators. There was a, a, um, a fifth grade teacher who wanted to bring uh, a artist who had immigrated from Afghanistan to do after-school workshops so students could learn about that country, meet someone from that country. There was a first grade teacher whose students had been saved by a particular group of firemen, and these first graders wanted to thank the firemen who had saved them by doing a musical performance in front of their fire ladder company. For that, they needed musical instruments. So there were hundreds of these projects, all related to 9-11, and I thought that local media would seize upon this story. This was right when uh, uh, people yearned to participate in the 9-11 recovery effort. Red Cross had almost too many blood donations than they could put to good use, and here was this direct way for people to help. But no reporter would give me the time of day. I think I called 100 of them with, with no success. So I figured I'd better aim higher. And Holy Grail was the New York Times. They, they had this uh, new reporter covering nonprofits and philanthropy. Her name was Stephanie Strom. Figured if we could get Stephanie Strom of the New York Times to do a story about our little website, we would have a shot at big time impact. So I put together a package of materials and I mailed them off to Ms. Strom at the Times and uh, I didn't hear back. So I called her up three weeks later and uh, she was nice to me, but she said that we were awfully small potatoes. She said, you know, if ever uh, I'm doing a, a, a listing of online charities, uh, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put you on that list, but uh, I'm afraid you're not exactly newsworthy. Damn. So then I found a directory of the top people at Newsweek, and I called the senior editor there. I called, uh, his name was Jonathan Alter. I called him first because his last name began with A, so he showed up first in the alphabetical directory. And, uh, and I called him during my lunch hour, and his assistant must have been out to lunch because he picked up the phone, and I said, hey, I'm a teacher up in the Bronx. I started this nonprofit with my students. Do you want to hear about it? And he said, sure. He didn't hang up on me. We talked for 45 minutes, and that night he wrote a column for the Newsweek website saying that this experiment growing out of a Bronx classroom might one day change philanthropy. So then I called up. Uh, Ms. Strom at the New York Times, all excited, and I said, hey, Newsweek saw us as newsworthy, at least for their website, so won't you give us a second look? And then she dashed my hopes. She said, I wouldn't touch your story with a 10-foot pole now that another reporter has covered you. The New York Times does not follow in the footsteps of other publications. Oh, I felt like an idiot for having told her that another media outlet <laughs> had, had broken our story and I, I wrote her an email apologizing for, for being so dumb, and, and Ms. Strom could, could see how badly I felt, and she, she, took, she took pity, and, and she wrote back, and, and she said, you know, you shouldn't feel quite so bad because you didn't have a chance in the first place. <laughs> because, because her editors had asked her to focus on charities responding to 9-11. So there was my last opening. I, I, I crafted this email to Ms. Strom telling her about all the projects that teachers beside Ground Zero were creating on our site, focused on 9-11. And 
And I called her up. I called her over the weekend, so I would go straight to voicemail, and I wouldn't interrupt her while she was on deadline. I said, this is the last time you'll ever hear from me if you just read this one final email. Monday, I was back at school teaching, and I checked my email in between periods, and Ms. Strom had written back. She wanted to come do an interview for a major feature story in the New York Times. Let me tell you, uh, like, it felt like the skies had opened. My parents raised me to be humble, but this was the New York Times. <laughs> felt like the, the heavens had just parted, and I, I needed to shout. So, so I forwarded Ms. Strom's email to my friend, and I said, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview? That's what hustling will get you. I beat my chest. I talked all kinds of smack. I thought, I thought that I had hit forward, but, but I, 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 Roger knows, I, I, I had hit reply, and, and the moment I realized I yanked the electrical cord from out of the socket to turn off the computer, but it was too late, I sent that trash-talking, chest-beating, guess who said she wouldn't touch our story with a 10-foot pole and now wants an interview, email directly to Stephanie Strom, philanthropy reporter for the New York Times. <laughs> so naturally, I sent her another email apologizing for being so dumb. <laughs> and to Ms. Strom's eternal credit and mercy, she did not hold it against me. She went on to write uh, a major feature story for the New York Times, uh, uh, arguing that donorschoose.org uh, uh, represented the, the future of philanthropy. And since that time, we've, we've been uh, working our tails off to, to try and prove her right. Uh, as of today, uh, teachers at 64% of all the public schools in America have created project requests on our site. Million and a half people and partners have given uh, almost $330 million to classroom projects on our site. And there are 14 million kids, overwhelmingly from low-income communities, who now have books, art supplies, field trips, technology that they need to learn. Even better, you can see that uh, in Idaho, uh, we're seeing incredible participation. The 378 public schools in Idaho who have 944 teachers, nearly 1,000 teachers who've created projects on our site represent a very, very healthy portion of all the public schools and all the public school teachers in Idaho. And it's in a million and a half dollars that's gone to 2,200 projects. Now, um, one reason why we're seeing just a surge in donorschoose.org participation in Idaho is thanks to uh, an incredible program that's called Fuel Your School that we do with Chevron, where uh, during the months of uh, October and November, people in uh, participating markets, uh, especially in um, Ada and in Canyon counties, are able to uh, effectively support a nearby classroom when they fill up at a Chevron or Texaco. And here is what uh, has happened as a result. This is Idaho project funding, and we had a, a pretty nice climb and then the Fuel Your School program kicked in, and in 2014, uh, DonorsChoose.org participation is taking off now like a rocket ship in this home state. And I uh, never thought, my students and I never, ever, ever thought that I would one day uh, get to uh, come to Boise, speak with folks like you, share numbers like that. And we sure never thought that uh, crowdfunding would become part of the zeitgeist. When DonorsChoose.org began, uh, crowdfunding was years away from, from even being a word. And today, uh, it's, it's a movement. There are now hundreds of websites where people on the front lines can identify a need they see, propose a project they want to do, secure a microloan for a small venture they want to start. And then anyone, no matter the size of their wallet, can become a patron, uh, a philanthropist, a uh, financier. And, and these sites are taking off in all sorts of sectors and countries. I'll wager that within 10 years, a real percentage of our country's GDP will be represented by crowdfunded projects and crowdfunded ventures. So now I want to explain how we've made crowdfunding work in public schools in the United States. When a teacher submits a project for funding, we first make sure it's legit. And we email follow-up questions to the teacher if anything is unclear about what students will learn. This school year alone, we're going to have received about 250,000 project requests. 
each of which has to be individually vetted and carefully reviewed. And we used to pay people to do this work. And then we realized that our best teacher users were ready and willing to volunteer to vet other teachers' project requests. So now, if you're a teacher and you've had 20 projects funded through our site, you've proven yourself to be an amazing educator, we invite you to volunteer your time to vet other teachers' project requests. Think of it as kind of like academic peer review meets Wikipedia. And now that we uh, have crowdsourced this labor, instead of paying people to do it, the average time it takes us to vet and post and validate a teacher's project has gone from 10 days when we were paying people to do it to one and a half days now that we have uh, crowdsourced this labor. That, that's the power of, of pushing intelligence out to the edge, of asking your, your so-called beneficiaries to be your coworkers, which is what crowdfunding is all about. So now the project's up on our site, and at any given moment, there are usually about 40,000 project requests live on the site. That's obviously a lot to choose from, so we encourage uh, donors to express a personal passion and look at the projects that match. A few years ago, uh, a writer for Fortune magazine was doing a uh, story on Kiva and Donors Choose as the two websites that Fortune magazine thought were going to uh, change philanthropy. And uh, when we were done talking, the, the writer from Fortune, he seemed like decently impressed by our site, but he said that his personal passion was salmon in the Northwest, which, which might resonate with some of you. And that was his nice way of saying that uh, he, he, education was not quite his cause. He was all about uh, salmon in the Northwest. So before you left uh, the room, I did a keyword search for salmon, and up came five projects focused on salmon in the Northwest. The, the second project result was uh, from a teacher at a high school in Oregon who had created a salmon hatchery in the river uh, near his school, and he needed hip waders for his students to maintain and build out the hatchery. The top result for keyword search salmon was uh, a project from a teacher on an island off Alaska, teaching in a one-room schoolhouse. And I know there are 13 one-room schoolhouses still in Idaho. Uh, but this teacher in a one-room schoolhouse in, in Alaska, uh, she wrote in her project essay that she was 45 minutes away from the nearest store, an airplane. And all of her students are, are native Alaskans, and they had recorded their parents' folk tales about salmon, done research on salmon, and wanted to share that work with the outside world for which they needed a printer and a scanner. So here was this guy with a passion for salmon in the Northwest, and he had five projects to choose from. And as a result, uh, there's a, a high school class in Oregon that now has the hip waders they need uh, to maintain and, and build out their salmon hatchery. Last part of the DonorsChoose.org process is, uh, is the best part. When, when a teacher gets a project funded, we do not hand out cash to the teacher. Instead, we purchase the resources and have them delivered to the classroom. If the project is therapeutic horseback riding for disabled students, we pay the horseback riding stable to provide that service. And then every donor, even if they've given just one dollar to a, a chosen project, gets photographs of their project in action, thank you note from the teacher, uh, an impact letter that the teacher writes describing what students are learning. Donors who give fifty dollars uh, or more also get uh, handwritten student thank you letters, um, and, and they can even uh, respond to uh, the classroom and, and, and reply to the feedback. Our donors get to kind of see and feel and, and, and almost touch the impact uh, that they've had. Throughout this process, we try to be totally transparent. I'll give you one example. One, once in a while, um, a donor does not get those student thank you letters. It happens about two or three percent of the time. Internally, we call it a jilted donor situation. And it's usually for, usually for an understandable reason, like the teacher switched schools, maternity leave, uh, got laid off. Uh, uh, and when this happens, we uh, contact the donor and we acknowledge that we've fallen short, even though this donor has probably forgotten that they were ever due a package of student thank you letters in the first place. And we invite the donor to pick another project to support on our dime. Now, it sounds like a fall on your sword kind of thing to do, but most of our donors are blown away that we would proactively apologize for not providing that package of thank you letters. And um, while very few of them take us up on our offer of funding another project on their behalf, our apology note does often prompt them to make a whole new donation. So we once looked at the numbers and concluded that our, our single biggest uh, revenue driver, single biggest uh, driver of donations to classroom projects 
was screwing up and admitting it. I think there are, there are all sorts of lessons for, for the nonprofit sector and potentially even for the government sector in, in the value that we have derived from, from owning up uh, uh, where we're falling short and, and how our donors reward us when we do so. Now, uh, you've been very kind letting me uh, share a, a whole bunch of anecdotes and, and kind of uh, uh, human interest stories. And a lot of people out there think that that's all that crowdfunding and donorschoose.org are, are good for. Some some one-to-one -one connections, Some you can perform some good Samaritan deeds, be, be a classroom angel, but it's nothing that's going to change the system. There, there are a lot of uh, traditional uh, foundations that look at our site and they say, where's the beef? They, they might describe us as a Band-Aid solution uh, because they think that we address only the symptoms but not the causes of educational inequity. They might even worry that we let government off the hook by enabling private citizens to step in where the system is falling short. This afternoon, I want to respond to that skepticism because I think there are a few ways that uh, DonorsChoose.org could be a force for helping to reform and strengthen the education system itself. Two of the ways that I don't have time enough to describe to you in detail are helping ed tech entrepreneurs and inventors introduce new products and services directly to teachers, circumventing the educational industrial procurement complex. That's one way that, uh, that, that'll just uh, uh, remain as, as kind of a teaser that we can talk about during Q&A. Another way uh, is by um, identifying the very most innovative projects amongst the 800,000 that teachers have created because uh, what we, we, we attract the system's most passionate, most imaginative educators and the projects that they put up on our site represent their best ideas and we think we could do a great job of identifying the very best of those best ideas and encouraging all sorts of innovation and replication. That too is a teaser. Um, here's, here's uh, I'll tell you two ways that we think we could change the system itself that, where I'll give you just a little bit more detail. One of them is by opening up all of our data. Three, more than 300,000 teachers have created 800,000 projects on our site at 64% of all the public schools in America. And by opening up all that data, we can enable policymakers and legislators, uh, school district superintendents, state superintendents, to listen to what classroom teachers are trying to tell them in the projects that they're creating on our site. We've got statistical significance for the specific books that Idaho middle school teachers think are most effective at getting kids hooked on reading, as expressed by the books that they're requesting on our site. We can show you what technology devices are most needed by Idaho high school teachers, as expressed by the technology devices that those classroom teachers are most often requesting, which are sometimes different from what uh, the powers that be think is the, the sort of uh, shiniest new toy or what will make for the best press conference. And uh, uh, we are, we, we've hired a two-person data science team to kind of get a start on this. And, and they, they began first by looking at what drives what we call citizen philanthropy or, or micro-giving. And the first thing they found out was that uh, women tend to donate to classroom projects on our site throughout the school year, unprompted by any special occasion whereas men tend to donate to projects on special occasions and holidays. And that has nothing to do with working or not working because most people donate to classroom projects when they're at the workplace at 10 a.m. after their initial coffee break. Um, <laughs> and so our, our only theory was that altruism comes especially naturally to women, whereas men need an external stimulus to be philanthropic, something to like remind them to, to, to be kind and generous. Um, I'm not going to ask Leos and Cancers to raise their hands because uh, we found that uh, uh, Leos and Cancers uh, donate less frequently and make smaller donations on average. Um, Aries, Aries and Taurus uh, um, give uh, somewhat in, uh, they, they make smaller donations but they give more frequently. Now, Capricorns, would you raise your hands if there are any in the room? Congratulations, because your cohort uh, not only gives more frequently, but makes larger average donations. And we have no idea what's behind that. It is actually statistically significant. We have the birth dates of hundreds of thousands of our donors. <laughs> so that's just like a little bit of uh, sort of humorous uh, uh, findings of our data science team. I'll give you one more finding that um, is a little more substantive. This is an analysis of the impact of the recession 
on low-income versus upper-income classrooms. And what we found is that after the recession, uh, in low-income communities, the uh, proportion of requests for really basic materials as compared to uh, enrichment uh, materials skyrocketed. So in low-income communities, post the recession, way more teachers start requesting paper and books and dictionaries and just fundamental basic materials as compared to uh, butterfly cocoons or a shark cadaver for students to dissect or a field trip to Washington, D.C. Whereas in upper income communities, the recession led to no such increase in the proportion of requests for really basic materials, even though I'm sure plenty of upper income classrooms were still in need. And so what this tells us is that the recession had a terribly regressive, disparate impact on our public schools, leaving teachers in low income communities without the basics, and while teachers in upper income communities were still struggling, but at least had copy and paper pe present. Uh, in their classrooms. So this is just a, a flavor for how we hope to give voice to classroom teachers because we think that teachers, hardworking teachers, know their kids better than anybody else in the system. And if we can tap into their frontline expertise, we can uh, unleash better targeted and maybe even smarter micro solutions than what someone in academia or at the central office might come up with. And we think that uh, we, can give, we can give teachers a seat at the budget making table now that their voice can be heard in the data that we've opened up. Uh, that's th the last way uh, we think we could change the system itself is politically the spiciest and I think especially politically spicy in Idaho, given uh, the, the history and, and, and the attention that you had on uh, some measures related to uh, performance pay, merit pay, uh, and so forth. And what we call this internally is a third way on teacher performance pay, an alternative to teacher merit pay. I'll tell you what it is. It started a couple years ago when we were lucky enough to win the Google Impact Award and it came with a $5 million grant, and we used that $5 million grant to underwrite donors choose classroom funding credits that we gave to high school teachers who launched and helped their students pass math and science AP courses. So the way it worked was, at all these low-income public high schools, any teacher who raised their hand to say, I'm gonna start a calculus AB course or a physics AP course, got upfront donors choose classroom funding credits. Think of it as an altruistic signing bonus so that the teacher could fund their own projects and get the graphing calculators they would need to teach calculus AB or build the lab they would need to do biology AP. And then at the end of the school year, every student who passed their math or science AP exam unlocked $100 of donors choose classroom funding credits for their teacher to spend on their own projects or their colleagues' projects. And the response to this was so exciting. Teachers launched 500 new math and science AP courses to take advantage of this opportunity that we took this same approach with girls learning the code. So last year, for several months, any public school teacher in America could unlock $1,000 of donors choose classroom funding credits if and when at least four of their female students demonstrated proficiency in computer science fundamentals using either Code Academy or your friend's Khan Academy. And, uh, you know, this might sort of look like, smell like, sound like merit pay because it's a financial reward commensurate to student educational outcomes, but by switching the currency with which the uh, reward is paid from cash money to classroom funding credits, we've created something totally different. We're speaking of teachers' hearts rather than to their wallets because newsflash, teachers didn't get into the profession uh, because they wanted to make a huge amount of money. And you can imagine what, what the, the uh, dynamic is like for students who can say, you see that classroom library that was just delivered yesterday? I got that for our classroom when I passed the Calculus AB exam. That field trip we went on yesterday, I made that possible when me and my girls learned how to code. Teachers and teachers' unions have responded to this alternative take on merit pay with a whole lot of receptivity and, and even straight up enthusiasm. And we'd like to think, we hope, that in the kind of venomous debate between uh, teachers unions and reform warriors, we may have found some common ground, a, a form of uh, investing in teachers and rewarding educational accomplishment that 
speaks to uh, 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 teachers better angels and speaks to why they got in the classroom in the first place. And Harvard Business School is even doing a study right now uh, comparing the effectiveness, the motivational power of this altruistic reward as compared to a cash reward or a mere pat on the back. And suffice to say, you get a serious educational multiplier when giving this altruistic classroom funding reward. So that's our story of how we began. That's how we operate under the hood. That's the most horribly embarrassing thing I ever did. Those are a couple ways uh, we think that we could help to change the system itself and show that crowdfunding is, is more than, than uh, 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 addressing symptoms and, and that we can actually attack the causes of educational inequity. And now we're coming to the part uh, where we're going to do something that's never been done at ed sessions before. Uh, Albertson uh, Family Foundation was, was nice enough to uh, give kind of a, a charitable uh, honorarium for, for my coming to speak. And I want to invite you to spend uh, that honorarium on classroom projects of your choice. So you are each about to be given a $250 Donors Choose gift card so that you can choose a classroom project that you would like to support. And there'll probably be folks uh, who are passing those out uh, as we speak. Now, um, this is the gift of giving that our board member Stephen Colbert gives to every guest uh, who goes on his show, but, uh, at the Colbert Report, and then very shortly uh, at the Late Show. Uh, and so I just want to give you a flavor for the kinds of projects that people pick when they get this Donors Choose gift card. Amy Sedaris, uh, the comedian, after she went on the Colbert Report, she spent her Donors Choose gift card on um, a Kentucky fourth grade classroom's request for uh, science, hands-on science equipment. Uh, Kevin Bacon, he spent his Donors Choose uh, gift card on a Brooklyn kindergarten classroom's request for tink Tinker Toys and Lincoln Logs. David Mamet, uh, the playwright in the middle, he spent his uh, gift card on a New Orleans teacher who needed art supplies for her students to express their feelings and emotions about the BP oil disaster. Christiana Manpour, she picked two projects uh, focused on students on the autism spectrum. And Tom Brokaw, uh, he spent his gift card on a Washington State teacher's request for tablets. Now, the Albertson Family Foundation has uh, done some real work to curate some of the most innovative, most compelling, most technology-driven projects that Idaho teachers have created. So I hope that you will take your $250 Donors Choose gift card and go to donorschoose.org slash ed sessions, where you will see these hand-picked Idaho projects that the Albertson Family Foundation has thought, uh, uh, has, has deemed to be uh, especially innovative. And as you look for a project that you're going to support, I hope you'll think about uh, the town where you grew up and, and see whether there are any projects nearby, or your favorite author, or the hobby that you're pursuing, because even amongst Idaho projects, you might still be able to express that really personal passion and find an Idaho project that, that matches your passion. And I hope that as you spend the gift card, as you're going through checkout, you will tell the classroom why you chose their project. That's part of the checkout flow is for you as the donor to write a note to the teacher and students saying, here's why I picked your project. And I hope as you do this, as you find a project that, that really speaks to you personally, that you will take a step back and appreciate what anyone and what you can do with a dedicated teacher when gatekeepers do not stand in your way. Thank you for your time. <laughs>